All right, we're finished. We have finished up our conversation on how to study the Bible. And um, if you missed any of those, they're all online for you. We're on uh, this little seven-part series. But tonight, we want to learn how to share what we've learned, right? And this will go into any subject, anything that we learn. All the rules tonight or the things we'll discuss tonight all apply to sharing whatever. But obviously, we're going to continue our focus on the Sabbath and how to share the Sabbath with other people. I'm sure, I would assume, we've all tried. Most of us have tried, if not all of us have tried. And you get all kinds of uh, various answers from people. Some people are interested and want to study. Some people just immediately start with the excuses of why they're too busy. Some people, you know, vehemently deny it and say, no, it's not the Sabbath. And so how can we reach people with this important truth um, uh, that, that we want to share. Well, I'm trying to make it easy. I've given you three C's to remember, okay? These three C's you see on the, on the, on the screen, these are the three C's we're going to talk about tonight. We'll spend most of our night discussing carefully, um, but all three of these, carefully, convincingly, and with conviction, okay? Carefully, convincingly, and with convention, conviction, the three C's of sharing. So as we discuss carefully, that obviously uh, can mean a lot of things, and I think they're all true with this. Number one, we want to uh, be kind and considerate, obviously. We don't want to be judgmental. Um, we don't necessarily believe this anyway, but our first line shouldn't be, you know, going to church on Sunday is a sin, right? We should be careful in what we say and how we say it. Um, and not over-exaggerate the truths that we believe, because the Sabbath, is it good news or bad news? news. It's good news, right? It's an absolute blessing, and so we should present it as such, as a blessing, as a blessing. But um, carefully can also get into the world of um, how we share it with others, not just not judgmentally, but also in how we, what, what focus we'll have as we present the Sabbath. I want to remind you, and we'll actually spend time in 20 or 30 minutes or so going through this, but as we start, I want you to think for a moment the different things that are included in the Sabbath, all the different ways, all the different blessings it gives us, those are all various ways to reach somebody. So here's what I mean. Here, we're going to go into a little study tonight as we jump into carefully. God speaks to people in various ways, okay? In different manners. If we were to share our testimony tonight of how we even accepted salvation, we might all have a little different steps to our testimony. Some of us hit rock bottom and there was nowhere else to go but up. Some of us uh, it was through the Bible study, and we found it interesting. We studied more. Some of us, you know, uh, it could be a, a health issue, and God performed a miracle, and that brought us. And so salvation, the news of salvation comes different ways. Well, the news of the Sabbath comes different ways as well. So here's what I mean, that God speaks to people differently. You recognize this guy? This is his yearbook photo. Not really. This is Abraham. I know. We're not supposed to recognize him, right? He lived a long time ago. This is, <laughs> this is Abraham, okay? Let's notice three of the examples of how God spoke to Abraham. And by the way, we're going to go golden thread this evening. We're going to find stories all throughout the Bible. And we're going to go through a pattern. I want you to catch the pattern. What God says to Abraham in these three different stories, I want you to catch the pattern. The first one is in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. First book of the Bible, of course, chapter 12. Notice how, what God says to him and the importance or the focus of this discussion. You know, uh, Jeff and I discussed this afterwards. I don't know if anyone else happened to hear this. God spoke verbally to people, face to face with people, a whole lot more early on in the Bible. And then a lot less. Then it became through visions, and now it's through Bible study, right? 
And so he spoke more face to face with them because they didn't have scriptures to turn to. Now we have scriptures to turn to where we can read God's words, right? So he's speaking directly face to face here with Abraham. Who would like to read verse 2 and verse 3? And then verse, uh, verse 2 and verse 3. Go ahead. Anybody? Thank you, Miss Norma. Okay. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will see thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Thank you. Okay, so when God spoke to Abraham, do you catch a theme here of what he's discussing? It's all focused on family. Family plays an important role in what he says here in chapter 12. And it, as we're going to notice, it play, it's going to play an important theme throughout these stories, okay? So God speaks to Abraham. He speaks to him about family, about descendants, about the families of the earth. Now jump with me to chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And who would like to read verse 5? This still is God speaking to Abraham. And Jeff's going to read verse 5. Genesis 15, verse 5. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, Oh, yeah, you're if good. indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall be your offering be. So your, offspring. your offspring. Be. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So shall your offspring be. Yeah. So again, God is speaking to Abraham. What's the theme? Descendants, right? Your family, your offspring. Okay. Now let's jump to the story in uh, chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Here, God is speaking again to Abraham, again face to face. And now he's warning him about what's going to happen in Sodom. Chapter 19 is the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God is speaking to Abraham. He's going to tell him what's going to happen. And notice his theme again with Abraham. Genesis 18, and who would like to read verses 17 and 18? Okay. Okay. Three stories. God speaking to Abraham. All three times, God's direction or his purpose in speaking to him, his theme was family. What can you get from this about Abraham? What was important to him? What was on his mind a lot? Family, right? When he's in Egypt and he's worried about Sarah, family. It's his marriage, right? Every story about Abraham is about family. And so God, speaking truth to Abraham, spoke to him about family, right? God cares about what we care about. Is that good news? God cares about what we care about, right? Those important things, not necessarily the worldly things, but those really important vital things. He cares about what we care about. God had a specific message for Abraham. It mattered to Abraham. It was important for Abraham to hear, so God spoke about what Abraham was going to hear. Family, okay? So for those who just stepped in, we're discussing the three C's of sharing, carefully, convincingly, and with conviction. We're discussing carefully first, and we're noticing carefully not, doesn't just mean um, kind, which is important as well, but also we need to speak to people the way that they need to hear about God. We have to know them well enough, okay? All right, so that's Abraham, okay? Here's our next story. That, well, this one you might be able to figure out who that is. Who's that? Peter. 
right? What do we know about Peter? Peter think about what he was going to say first? No. no. Was Peter impulsive? Yeah. yeah. Peter was loud and impulsive, always stating his opinion, always bossing things around, always trying to take charge, right? Okay. And you know this story? They see Jesus walking on water. What does Peter say? I want to walk on the water. <laughs> and then he gets out on the water, and then his brain starts to catch up with his actions and his mouth. And what does he do? He looks back and he sings, right? Like, ah, what am I doing here? Right? Whoosh. Okay. He was impulsive. He was emotional. Let's catch this in John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Jesus is talking about how he's going to be denied. How the, the men, his brothers, his disciples around him are all going to turn on him. Peter is impulsive, and he makes a declaration that evening, sitting around the table. John chapter 13, and who would like to read verse 37 and 38? Thank you, Miss Norma. 37 and 38. Okay, Peter, getting a little emotional. He's speaking necessarily without thinking about it, right? Lord, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to follow you. I, I, I'm going to lay my life down for you, right? And then he gets corrected by Jesus. How many times was he going to go on to deny Jesus? Three. Three times, okay? So what we're doing is we're noticing that God speaks the way our ears are going to hear it, okay? Peter's a little emotional, He's impulsive. So, he does deny Jesus. Jesus dies. Jesus resurrects. And then, sometime while Jesus is with the disciples, he pulls Peter aside and has a conversation with him. Let's find that story in John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Remember, he denied him three times. Okay? Now, let's read. Who would like to read 15 through 17 here? Thank you, Ray. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. And verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all these things. Thank you. All right. Abraham cares about family. God speaks to him about family. Peter is emotional. How does, what does Jesus speak to him about? Emotions. What is love, right? Love is an emotion, right? Okay. So he comes back to Peter. Peter's denied him three times. And he asks him a very important question. How many times? Three times, right? He denied him three times. He is re reaffirmed in Jesus three times. Peter, do you love me? And by the third time, do we see an emotional Peter starting to come out? Gre he's grieving. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Not all guys can tell each other that they love them, that they love each other, right? Some guys can do that. Some bros can do that. Some guys hang on, go, hey, I love you all the time, right? Peter, though, is a guy who can say, I love you. And so what does Jesus want to hear from him? Do you love me, Peter? And then he gives him directions. Are these important directions here to tend the sheep and feed his lambs? Yeah. So to get this important message across, he says it in a way that Peter would understand him. Okay? All right. The third story here. If ever you see a, a bald apostle, it's likely Paul. 
That's who that is. That's Paul. Okay. Paul, on the other hand, very different than Peter. Have you noticed that Peter and Paul didn't always get along? Why? Because they spoke different languages. They thought about the gospel a little differently. Peter was more emotional. Paul, he's more demanding. He's more of a critic. Okay? He's more of an authoritative guy. In fact, catch what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what, Pete, what Paul says to the church of Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. few books after the Gospels, you got Acts and then Romans and then 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Thank you, Tom. Imitate me just as I also imitated Christ. Interesting. Anyone else here tell people to imitate them as they Im uh, imitate Christ? No, I mean, now, now, that's not necessarily bad. If you're following Christ, you could say, hey, do what I do and, and, and imitate Christ because you see Christ in me, right? But Paul isn't just being a good example. This is Paul. He's demanding. He's more like, hey, guys, I'm in charge here. Follow what I'm doing. I'm the boss, right? This is the Paul we find throughout his writings. And as a perfect example, he says, guys, imitate me the way that I imitate Christ, okay? He's not a, for the lack of a better term, he's not trying to be a jerk here. He's not trying to be rude. He's not egotistical. He also says he's the chief sinner, right? He's as demanding of himself as, as he is as, uh, uh, of others, okay? So, he's demanding. Now we go to Paul. I mean, I'm sorry, how God spoke to Paul. How do you expect God to have spoken to Paul? Authoritatively, right? Demandingly. Let's notice this. Acts chapter 9. Two books before 1 Corinthians. Acts chapter 9. This is Saul. He's still Saul at this point. He's on his way to, to Damascus to, to martyr some Christians, to persecute some Christians. And Jesus stops him and speaks to him. Um, Acts chapter 9, and we're going to start the story at verse 4. As we read, catch how God, how Jesus speaks to Paul. Okay, or Saul at this point. Who wants to start reading at verse 4? And you'll read 4 through 6. Mary Lou, thank you, Mary Lou. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gore. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Do you notice all the, 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 the authoritative conversation here that Jesus has for him? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? That, that's demanding, like, answer my question right now, right? And then he's accusing him of what he's doing. And then when, he, when he's listening, and now he's malleable, now he's, now he's going to follow whatever Jesus says, does Jesus say, do you, do you feel bad for what you've done, buddy? Do, do you feel repentant, you know? I mean, is there, is there a heart change going on with you? Do you know, Saul, that I could have killed you, but I love you and I care? About is that what he's saying here? No, he's like, arise, go, and stay, and be baptized, right? He's demanding him. He's telling him what to do. Why is God, why is Jesus God, why is he speaking to Paul this way? Because that's the language Paul's ears work with, right? Demanding authoritative, okay? All right, one more example of this. You can know who that, you know who that guy is. You don't need his yearbook. That's Moses, right? Okay. What do we know about Moses? The whole story of the time of, what's he holding, first of all? The Ten Commandments, right? The law, okay? And it's not just random laws, they're numbered, right? 
And in fact, are these the only laws that Moses would get? No. There were the, these are the 10 laws that God wrote with his own finger. But then Moses had to write a whole bunch of laws, hundreds of laws down, right? Okay? It's almost like he's a lawyer. God's, you know, it's almost like he's thinking legally, right? He's like contracts. The book of Numbers. Why do we call it the book of Numbers? What are they doing during the book of Numbers? They're wandering, and their years are being counted, but they're also numbering the people of Israel. They're, it's a census, right? So how does Moses think? He's all about contracts and numbers and statistics and the whole bit, right? He wants things detailed, okay? He wants things detailed. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3. This is the first time God spoke to Moses. I believe this was Jesus. I think most of us believe this was Jesus who spoke to him at the burning bush. And in one of the most beautiful verses, I love uh, Exodus chapter 3. We're going to notice verse 7 and 8 here. Beautiful verses, but I want you to catch the detail here in this gospel proclamation. Okay, who wants to read Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8? Thank you, Miss Norma. Okay. Um, and the Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring uh, them up out of that land unto a good land and large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. <laughs> and if you continue reading through the whole chapter, it's just like this. Okay, it's very detailed. I want you to, did you catch it as we read? I have seen the oppression. I've heard their cries. I know. He's going down the whole list of what he does as God, right? I've, 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 I'm experiencing, I know, and so I have come down. Why? Because I'm going to deliver. He's going detail by detail, and it's the gospel. Isn't this the gospel? It's a gospel proclamation to him, right? Right? What is, what is today when we repent of our sins? Does, does this still happen? God has seen it. God hears our prayers. He knows what we're going through. So he's come down to deliver us, right? Jesus came to deliver us, right? And then to what? To deliver us to a better land. And he doesn't just say the promised land. He says to a land, a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and with honey, to the place. And then he lists all these different um, tribes that live in the land, right? Why is he speaking so detailed? See, a guy like me with ADHD, I, if God was speaking to me like this, I'd, I'd lose. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I have to write this down. Like, there's too many directions, too many details, right? Right? Sometimes when people do it to me, you know, they call me and like, well, then you got to do this and then this and this. I'm like, okay, hold on. It's just too many details. <laughs> Can you email this to me, please? Can you text this to me, please? Or something? You know, it's like it's just my brain doesn't process it all. But why is God being so detailed with Moses? Because that's how Moses thought. That's how he processed things. Very important conversations. All conversations about the story of salvation, right? The gospel proclamation of God to man. And God, even though it's one truth, and it all, it's all the golden thread, it's all solid from Genesis to Revelation, he presents it in different ways to how we're going to hear it. He gets their attention and things that they care about, Okay. We see it in Abraham, we see it in Peter, we see it in Paul, we see it in Moses. Okay, so Jesus meets people where they are, and because we all listen differently, God presents the same message in different ways, in different formats. Amen. Is that good news? It's very good news, right? If he was a stubborn God who only presented it one way, but he cares about everybody, for God so loved the world, the demanding he loves the, the detailed. He loves the emotional. That's the group I'm in. He loves the people who care about family and supportive, you know, supportive kind of people. He loves everybody, and so he presents the gospel in these different fashions. 
So when we talk about sharing the Sabbath or sharing anything, but specifically to our lesson, sharing the Sabbath, carefully sharing it means know your audience. Know your audience. Know who you're presenting it to. Okay? Know, know something about, this, about the person. So here's a couple of examples. If you're speaking to someone who isn't married, someone with no interest in marriage, would you use how the Sabbath and marriage are the only thing sanctified in the Garden of Eden to try to win them over to understanding the Sabbath? No, because they would be like, I don't, I don't want to get married. Who cares? Right? Their ears kind of shut. They might even go, uh-huh, yeah, okay, interesting. But they don't have a connection to marriage, so why would we talk about that, right? If you're talking about uh, talk, discussing this with an evolutionist, a scientist, not just some, an atheist, but like a scientist who believes in evolution, would we talk about how the Sabbath is a memorial to creation? I, I wouldn't just because they would go, nope, psh, creation? Nope, I don't believe in creation. Okay? Now, we can, might talk about creation at some point, and then we can, if you get them to understand creation, then we could bring the Sabbath up that way. But if they're most evolutionists, you, once you say the word creation or young earth, whoop, ears are shut off, right? We could find another way to present the Sabbath to them. If you're talking to a Jewish person, would you talk about how Jesus kept the Sabbath as our perfect example? No, because they've denied Jesus. Right? What, what do they care? Or the apostles, we talk about how Paul did it? No, what do they care? Right? So for each person, we have to know our audience. Whatever it is that we are sharing with people, know your audience. Know what they're going through. Know who they are. Try to understand their personality and get to know them and then get to teach Jesus to them. Okay? All right. So here's a couple of different Sabbath themes for us. Different ways that we could reach someone with the Sabbath truth. If they're into creation or nature, they like hiking, they like the mountains, they like going outside, they like doing outdoor things, perfect way to, to introduce the Sabbath to them, right? As a memorial to creation or as some, a day that we spend, part of the day, you know, enjoying nature, celebrating nature, celebrating what God has given us through nature, right? If you know someone who's an authoritarian, Someone who likes rules, someone who's commanding. Well, where would you turn? I know it's on the board there, but where, how could you present the, the Sabbath to them? Through the law of God, right? Because they speak law. They speak, to, you know, co they're commanding. They're in charge or whatever, okay? Someone who's stressed out. Well, take them to Matthew chapter 11 when Jesus says, Come unto me, you who are, you know, burdened and heavy laden, right? And I shall give you Rest for your souls. What day of the week did he say that on? Matthew 12, 11, 1. The very next verse after he says that says, Now as he said these things, it was the Sabbath. Right? Okay? The Sabbath is a day of rest. If they're a workaholic, ooh, wow, well, I don't know. Are you thinking a workaholic's going to want to take a day off? No? So maybe not the best way to reach a workaholic just because that's all they want to do is work, work, work. Right? So maybe saying, hey, you need a day of rest. And they would say, well, no kidding, but I got this contract and this thing to do and this thing to do, right? We have to know our audience. All right? Next one's prophecy. Someone's interested in prophecy. They like, they like the things of Revelation. Could you go to Revelation and show them the Sabbath and introduce them to the Sabbath? What's the first angel's message, right? Does that have to do with worshiping the Creator? Absolutely. So you could take them to, to there. How about somebody who is apostolic? Someone who pays a lot of attention to the apostles. There's the apostolic church, and they believe all doctrines come from the book of Acts. Could you go to the book of Acts and prove, and prove the Sabbath? Yeah, that this, the apostles kept the Sabbath. We've done that here. That's why I'm kind of running over this quickly, because we've done that in our series here. We've done that, okay? And then the last one, someone who is a good, caring heart. Someone who enjoys serving others. Someone who enjoys community service. Does the Sabbath have anything to do with that? Can you think of a verse that, that talks about uh, the Sabbath and caring for others? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, right? Jesus mentions that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 12. And there's so many more examples. I didn't want to keep you here tonight, but you could come to the Sabbath truth with someone in so many different ways. 
Are all these things true? All these things are true, right? We're not saying there's many truths. There's one truth, but God has presented many different ways to present the truth. So when we discuss sharing the Sabbath with people, do it carefully, yes, kind and considerate and non-judgmental, but at the same time, don't waste your time. Speak, this, uh, talk about the Sabbath, share the Sabbath in ways that they'll listen. If someone is staunchly against the Ten Commandments, a lot of Christians believe the Ten Commandments were done away with, right? And I realize when they say that they only really mean the Sabbath commandment, they don't believe we can kill or steal or commit adultery. But if they're staunchly against the Ten Commandments, absolutely not. You are Adventist, you, you keep the Ten Commandments. That's legalism. Is turning to Exodus 20 the best way to, to teach them the Sabbath? The Sabbath? No, stay away from that. You'll get there because we want to present a full truth at some point, but go somewhere else. Okay, you know what? We're, we're not legalists, but okay, well, let's stay away from the law. Let's look at some examples of the, of the apostles. Let's talk about how God, how Jesus served people and healed people on the Sabbath and cared for people on the Sabbath, right? So know your audience. Get to people the way, or teach this to people the way that they will hear it. All right, let's discuss convincingly, convincingly. Well, we've had the tools presented to us in this series of the Sabbath, plenty of verses. We've gone over what the Sabbath is. We've looked at it as through the golden thread. We've done here a little, there a little principles. We've noticed patterns and things of the Sabbath. But we've also looked at these tricky verses, right? We've got these tricky verses. And so now we can present the Sabbath convincingly. In other words, if they say, oh, no, you know, Paul says to esteem whatever day you want. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. And then you can go through that with him, right? Oh, no, you know, they, they, they broke bread on the first day of the week. Oh, well, then you can say, so do it convincingly. Let's notice what 2 Timothy chapter 4 says. 2 Timothy, New Testament. Second Timothy chapter four and verse two. Who'd like to read verse two for us? Anybody? Second Timothy chapter four and verse two. Uh, Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Good. Careful instruction. So we see the careful in your version. Mine doesn't say careful, but mine uses the word convince in, in the New King James. So we see these words, right? Careful instruction, convince people, preach the word, and be ready. Be ready. If you had a big test coming up for work, what would you be doing before the test? You'd be studying, right? I'd be studying for the test, right? We'd be studying. Uh, a few years ago, I had to pass three classes in a summer um, between uh, uh, Holbrook school years. And it was either pass them or not work the next year. I had to get caught up on some classes that I was behind because, well, I worked 80 hours a week, right? So I had to get these classes done. And I found out that I could challenge them. It was Adventist doctrine, Adventist history, and um, the book of Daniel. Well, I thought, I think I can challenge these. I'm, I know all these things. But I didn't just go, ah, I know these things and go, to go do it. I had some time. I had all summer. So what do you think I did? Went and studied, right? Study, 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 study. Took the test. Study, study, study. Took the next test. Study. You have a test coming up. You got to study, right? Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, for sharing the Sabbath, when someone says, hey, could you come over and share the Sabbath with me? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No problem. You go home, you grab your notes, you go to their house, right? You've got your notes in front of you. But also, out of season. What do you think is a, an example of out of season? Walking down the street. Walking down the street. Someone's like, hey, you're, you're an Adventist. Right? I saw you at that Adventist church, right? Uh, could you, could, why, why do you guys go to church on Saturday, right? Um, hmm, uh, ask my pastor, right? <laughs> and that, that's okay, by the way, if, if you don't know. But as students of the Bible, we want to study and have our notes and be ready in season and out of season, right? That's okay, though, if we need help. I didn't, you know, it's okay if we need a crutch a little bit here and there. 
But study these things, study these things when you're at home, when you're at, you know, study these things so that you can present these things in a convincing manner. Preach the word, right? Preach the word. All right, the, the last thing, the third C, with conviction. This is so important, with conviction. You ever heard this phrase? Do as I say, not as I do. It's hard, it's difficult to preach the Sabbath if we're not keeping the Sabbath, right? If we're not Sabbath keepers, it's kind of difficult to preach the Sabbath to other people, right? There are times when I get caught unprepared for something and I've got to run and get gas on a Sabbath afternoon because I've got to get to Lone Pine or Tonopah and something I didn't know. Or, or I was just so busy on Friday, I wake up Sabbath morning and I'm preaching in Tonopah. It's happened a couple times. I'm like, oh, I was supposed to get gas yesterday and I forgot, right? Oh, it's like the walk of shame. It's like I, I go to the gas pump and I'm like, you know, like I want to put a mask on. I'm always worried that someone's going to see me, right? It's not a lifestyle thing. I don't always know, but at times when there's an emergency or something, ah, oh, right? Well, if we're going to teach people the Sabbath, we've got to be Sabbath keepers, Amen. right? Not, I'm talking lifestyle. There's moments where things, you know, get, get thrown in our face or, you know, things here and there, you know, surprises. But as a lifestyle, we should be in church. We should be keeping the Sabbath during the rest of the Sabbath hours. So with conviction, if I don't believe it, if I'm not interested in it, if I'm not keeping it, what kind of conviction do I have as I teach it? Oh, man. I mean, if I was asked to teach an accounting class, you know, pastors have to teach financial burden, uh, financial uh, awareness, right? If I was asked to teach an accounting class, I might be able to throw some numbers together in a pretty interesting class together, I hope, on stewardship and things. But it's not really my passion. I, I pay my tithes and offerings, and we have good credit and things, but it's not my passion. I go in and like... We can kind of get through the class. Can people usually tell when the teacher doesn't really care about what they're teaching? We really can, right? We can tell when the person really isn't that interested. Or someone who's going door to door selling stuff, or someone who's sitting at Sam's Club and they're trying to get you to buy a, the bag of pasta that's on sale and they're just like, here, try some pasta. <laughs> right? They just don't really care about it. Right? If you know, we have to love God's word and then share God's word because we love God's word, right? That should show in us, it should be a part of who we are that God's word has changed our lives, okay? Not do as I say, not as I do. That's hypocrisy, okay? Let's finish one more verse here. First Timothy, the book right before where we are. First Timothy, chapter 4. And who would like to read verse 12 as we close? 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Norma. I think we're just all about there. Yeah. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Okay. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and purity. I think mine, mine says in conduct. Oh. In word and in conduct. It might have said conversation in yours, but at least in mine it says in conduct. Right? Mm -hmm. Be an example to the believers in word. Most of us can do that just fine. We know our doctrines. We know what the Bible teaches, but also in conduct. And then you see some of the other things that, that go back to careful. Also, we want to preach these things in love, in the right spirit, in faith, and in purity, right? We kind of talked about judgment last week. Worst thing we can do but with the Sabbath is by judging other people, right? Oh, you guys, you're, you know, that's the mark of the beast. Oh, that. We have to teach that stuff because it's biblical and it's important, but it has to be with the right spirit of heart, right? The right spirit behind it in love, in word, and in conduct. So we want to share everything we believe the Bible teaches us. We want to share the things that, that are important to us. But do it carefully by knowing your audience. 
Do it convincingly. Study, study, study. And do it with conviction. If it's important to you, that importance will come out in how you teach it. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being with us through this series, Lord. Uh, I think we've really grown a lot in how to study, how to understand the Bible better, how to understand some of these tricky verses. But Father, now we've uh, spent time learning how to share. And so, Lord, present these opportunities now to us. Bring these things up in conversation. Help us to be able to share these things with others. Um, Give us the spirit that we need, uh, not just the spirit of love and kindness, but also um, of discernment so that we know our audience, so we know how to share it, which avenue to take, Father, to open the door of the heart, to plant a good seed in good soil. We need help from above. So help us do that, Father, and give us these tests right away. Give us opportunities, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.